Welcome to episode number 329, where I'm speaking with Dr. Tom O'Brien about the common source of environmental toxins, like food, personal care products, and items you have in your home. We talk about how these toxins create inflammation in the body and can lead to disease. So please stay tuned. Hi there, I'm your host Colette, and on this podcast, I will be sharing the teachings of Ayurveda, yoga, and holistic health practices. Now, if you're new to Ayurveda, I recommend checking out the first couple of episodes where I do an introduction to Ayurveda and the mind-body types. Thanks for listening, and now here is a new episode. Welcome back to the Elements of Ayurveda podcast, and today I'm very happy to welcome Dr. Tom O'Brien, who is a renowned functional medicine expert in environmental medicine and a leading voice in the field of holistic health and wellness. With an impressive career dedicated to uncovering the hidden impacts of environmental toxins on family health, Dr. O'Brien offers invaluable insights into nurturing healthier generations. He holds teaching faculty positions with the Institute for Functional Medicine and the National University of Health Sciences. He is the author of You Can Fix Your Brain and The Autoimmune Fix, and his new docuseries, The Inflammation Equation, Decoding the Steps for Optimal Well-Being, will be available to stream on March 20th, 2024, and we're going to talk about that today. Dr. O'Brien, it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much. Pleasure to be with you. Dr. O'Brien, you are a expert in environmental medicine and uncovering the hidden impacts of environmental toxins. And I'd love to start the podcast today with talking about environmental toxins, which can be overwhelming for many people, just the subject of it. And I'd like to start with what are some of the most common environmental toxins today? Uh, The most common source of environmental toxins impacting on our health is what's on the end of your fork. Mm. Most common. I'll give you an analogy. And this this is my personal opinion that I'm about to tell you. And and I'll always tell you if it's my personal opinion, everything else I say is just pure science. Uh, But it's my opinion that the most sensitive tissue in the human body to environmental toxins, the most sensitive tissue is a fertilized egg. Mm. It has no immune system yet, no way to protect itself. It's totally dependent on mom's womb for protection and creating an environment that supports ideal growth. So this is a study that came out in 2019 in the Journal of the American Medical Association from Harvard. And the editors of the journal wrote a comment. They said, this is an elegant study using sophisticated biomarkers to demonstrate their point. Now, the editors of the journal, the American Medical Association, don't say that very often. They don't give a stamp of approval to an article. Uh, it's, It's really a big feather in your cap if your research article is published in the premier journal in the English language. Mm -hmm. So the the editors don't give out praise very often, but they did in this study. So that really caught my attention and validated, I better pay attention to this study. They looked at couples at assisted fertility centers. And as you know, maybe some of your friends, couples are spending tens of thousands of dollars of their own money, because insurance doesn't pay for this, trying to get pregnant and trying to have a healthy pregnancy and a healthy delivery. They want a family. It's a beautiful thing. So in this study, they ruled out um, every known feature that determines success or failure. Cigarette smoking, alcohol consumption, uh, exercise, no exercise, socioeconomic class, race, um, sleep patterns. They ruled it all out in an elegant way and looked at just one thing. How many servings of fruits and vegetables was the woman eating a day? 
Well, we all know the answer, the outcome to that study, the more fruits and vegetables, the better. No, they divided the women into fourths, the lowest number of servings per day of fruits and vegetables, the next, the third, and the highest amount of servings per day of fruits and vegetables. And the results were shocking. Women in the category of eating the highest amount of servings of fruits and vegetables per day compared to women in the category of eating the lowest amount of fruits and vegetables today. If you were in the highest category, you had an 18% less likelihood of successful implantation. 18%. And if you got pregnant, you had a 26% less likelihood of a live birth. More miscarriages and more stillbirths. Wait, what? The more fruits and vegetables I eat, the worse the outcome? Yes. Wait, what? That doesn't make sense to anyone. Mm. Until you look at the subcategory of women who are eating organic. And in that category, the results were the exact opposite. The more servings of fruits and vegetables per day, The more success in implantation, the more success in healthy pregnancy and healthy delivery. It's the insecticides, the pesticides, the rodenticides, the fungicides, the glyphosate, the antibiotics that are in your carrots and lettuce and peaches and apples and bananas that you can't taste, you can't smell, but they accumulate in your body. They accumulate and they activate the immune system to create inflammation to protect you from this accumulated level of toxins. So, I mean, this is jaw dropping. I mean, this is killing babies. Eat fruits and vegetables, you kill more babies. Mm. What? What? But just read the science. It's really clear. This should have been on the front page of every newspaper in the country. But do you know why it wasn't? Because it came out just a li- right around the time that the virus started becoming a concern. And so nobody paid attention to this. Plus, the chemical industry made sure it got buried because they don't want people learning this information. I mean, they've got it good. You know, in the European Union, there are over 20,000 chemicals that are outlawed from being brought into the country for any reason whatsoever. In the United States, there are 12 that the chemical industry runs government regulations. Mm -hmm. Whoa, that's a pretty strong statement. The guy's exaggerating. No, the Toxic Substance Control Act regulates the introduction of chemicals uh, at the federal level in our country. And you have to demonstrate and the, the senators and representatives were paid off by the industry to sign this, this legislation. You have to demonstrate that the amount of chemical you're exposed to within a 24-hour period is toxic to humans. And they're not. They're minute amounts. Lead is not toxic at minute amounts. Right, right. But when it accumulates in your body, it becomes toxic. Mm -hmm. And that's true for all these chemicals. But the way they got around it is that you have to demonstrate it causes harm within 24 hours at the doses you're exposed to. And this is the Toxic Substance Control Act of 1976. And it's still the regulating guidelines. They make sure every year to spend millions. So no one touches that legislation. Mm. And so we've got so many thousands of chemicals. Most people have heard that uh, before you leave the house in the morning, the average woman has somewhere around 186 chemicals that she's put on her skin or breathed in. Men, it's in the 120s between the shampoos, the conditioners, the shaving cream, the the, uh, deodorants uh, that we're putting on our skin. We're layering ourselves with all these chemicals that are not toxic. Well, there's no evidence that the amount of chemicals that leach into your body from your shampoo is toxic to humans. There is no evidence whatsoever, but this stuff accumulates in the body. Mm -hmm. So give me a mom 
who is in the highest category of consumption of conventional fruits and vegetables that are loaded with so many pesticides, insecticides, rodenticides, fungicides, antibiotics, glyphosates, loaded. And they accumulate in the body. That mom has a more inflamed environment because the immune system is trying to protect you from something that's accumulated that's a threat to you. And that immune system with this generated inflammation stimulates the loss of the baby. Right. And there's also studies being done about the accumulation of toxins in the umbilical cord. Right. 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 Uh, which which means uh, anything that's in mom's blood, it's in baby's yeah. blood, right. almost everything. Right. But in terms of antibodies, no, not quite. Only IgG. And antibodies are just a branch of the armed forces. Mrs. Patient, your immune system is the armed forces in your body. It's there to protect you. There's an army, a navy, an air force, a marines, a coast guard. We call them IgA, IgG, IgE, IgM, cytokines. They're just different branches there to protect you. And there's only one of those antibodies that gets through the umbilical blood into baby. They're called IgG antibodies. Mm -hmm. They go right through into baby, mostly in the eighth month of pregnancy. They're allowed in. There's a little bit beforehand, but hardly any. But in the eighth month, the, the gates open to allow mom's IgG antibodies to get through into baby. Why? Because IgG antibodies are the immune system's way of protecting you from a threat that you're exposed to on a regular basis. Okay, baby, here's some IgG antibodies to cats. We have cats at home. They're really nice cats, but don't worry about it. You don't have to fight cats, you know, with your immune system or... Okay, baby, here's some IgG antibodies to mold. Now, we live in the forest, and the leaves fall down, they decay. There's mold spores in the air. Don't worry about it. You're safe. You're mm-hmm. safe. So baby is being primed for the environment that baby's about to come out into. And what environment is that? Mom's environment. So whatever mom is fighting, that activity, fighting, protecting, is going to be put into baby. So when mom doesn't check her food sensitivities that may not be making her sick, but she's got elevated IgG antibodies to different foods, baby gets all those inflammation markers before birth. They looked at a study of moms in the eighth month of pregnancy, and they measured the number of IgG antibodies to gluten uh, for uh, mom. So how many moms had IgG antibodies to gluten? And then they followed the offspring for 20 years of those pregnancies. And what did they find? If mom was in the highest 10% of antibodies to gluten during pregnancy, baby had a 70% increased risk of developing schizophrenia by the age of 30. If mom was in the top 5% of antibodies to gluten during pregnancy, it was a 250% increased risk of developing schizophrenia. Wait, what? Which means baby's brain never developed properly and completely. Some of the wires didn't get connected properly, if I can say it like that. And they checked the same thing with antibodies to dairy. No association at all. Only wheat. So every pregnant woman just needs to check accurately, but just check. Is my immune system fighting wheat right now? Even though you say, I feel fine when I eat sandwiches or when I eat pizza. I don't feel bad. That doesn't matter. For every one person that has gut symptoms with a problem with wheat, There are eight that don't have gut symptoms. They feel fine when they eat wheat, but they get brain symptoms. They they get seizures or they get depression or anxiety or they get skin symptoms, acne or psoriasis or eczema, or they get joint symptoms, arthritis or rheumatoid, 
or they get nerve symptoms, MS. It, it doesn't matter. Any system of the body may be affected. So you, you, you can't think that, well, I feel fine when I eat the food means that food is okay for you. If you use that as your determining criteria, you will get it right one out of eight times. And you get it wrong seven out of eight times. So uh, every pregnant woman, in my opinion, needs to be checked accurately for a sensitivity to wheat. Because I just told you one study, and there are literally hundreds of studies on the impact of mom having wheat sensitivity and what happens to baby. Uh, so that's just a very common environmental toxin. The most common source of environmental toxins is what's on the end of your fork. One more thing about the organic study and the couples at assisted fertility centers and the good news in that study. Women were put in the category of organic. If they ate organic, three servings a week, not 21 servings a week. If they just did three servings a week of organic produce, their results were completely reversed and much, much better. And we think, this was not in the study, but we think is probably because if you're eating organic produce three or more times a week, you're trying to be healthier. So you probably bought organic shampoo. You've got organic soap in your kitchen, right? So you're doing the other things that are easy. And some people are doing even more, the more difficult things, but you're doing some things to be healthier. So we think that's why just three servings a week of organic vegetables completely reversed the terrible outcome in couples who are really trying to start a family. Mm -hmm. As you said, that's very and, positive. Yes, yes, exactly. And yeah. this was in the journal of the American Medical Association. And the editor said, this is an elegant study using sophisticated biomarkers. So they gave the stamp of approval to don't ignore this study. Right. Thank you for highlighting that. I want to go back to ask you one more thing about wheat. With the wheat sensitivity, is this due to GMO grain? Is it due to pesticides on the crop? Is there a difference between organically farmed wheat versus pesticide-laden wheat? R really good question. And the inorganic foods always activate more inflammation than any organic food. So that's just across the board with any food. Um, ancient grains versus modern hybrid grains, glyphosate. No, no, that's not it. Uh, there's no question uh, glyphosate uh, came on the market around 1990 to 1995. Uh, but uh, celiac disease, as an example, increased 500% from 1950. Um, and it, there was no glyphosate around. Okay. Uh, but, but the shorter dwarf forms of wheat uh, were now being harvested. Like I, uh, a scientist won the Nobel Prize, I think it was in 1954, for developing dwarf wheat. Because wheat used to grow really tall, and in the fall, before harvest, the stems would break and it would die. So this guy developed dwarf wheat, which didn't, the stems didn't break, so they could harvest more per acre, and they were able to feed the world, um, change the world, really changed everything in terms of uh, countries that were starving, uh, more industrial countries would ship uh, large, large container, large ships of wheat grain to Africa and stop starvation and all that type of thing. So um, uh, the dwarf wheats um, uh, did make a change and it also changed in, uh, in our gut because dwarf wheats are higher in gluten and the modern wheats are even higher in gluten, which is the stickiness in wheat. So the, the, the more gluten, the stickier it is, the more you can stretch it and it won't tear apart. So and what that means, you get lighter bread, lighter cookies, lighter muffins. They can be stretched as they're baking. They stretch, stretch, stretch and open up and they don't collapse and fall apart. So yeah, that, that has been an aid in the, um, uh, preparation and, uh, options of eating wheat. Um, and it did create more gluten, which activates more of an inflammation. But that's not the reason why um, this has happened. 
Uh, the reason, to understand the reason, and it's worth taking the m- couple of minutes to do this because it's an aha. Ah, I didn't know that. You know, it's, it's one of those kind of mm-hmm. things. Mrs. Patient, you have the same body as your ancestor thousands of years ago. Exactly the same kidneys and lungs and immune system and gut function. And we use our brains more, so we've developed housing and, and food manufacturing. But it's the same body. And our ancestors, before 10,000 years ago, which is a, just a blip on the human screen, 10,000 years, but before that, our ancestors were nomads. They followed the herds. There was no agriculture. They followed the herds. And the number one concern was always the same, and that was uh, food. They had to find food. That was their biggest concern. and. So they'd walk around, they'd find something. First, they'd pick it up, they'd sniff it, then they nibble on it, and then they would eat it. And if there were bad bugs on the food uh, that they didn't identify by sniffing it or tasting it, dangerous bacteria, in your gut, you have these sentries standing guard. I like to think of the soldiers at Buckingham Palace with those big hats. Mm -hmm. They're as dormant as can be. You know, they're just standing there. They don't move. They're not doing anything. But don't mess with those guys. You know, that our immune system has soldiers standing guard. They're watching every morsel that comes out of the stomach into the small intestine, into the gut. They're called toll-like receptors. And they're watching everything. And if they see a bug, their job is to immediately do two things. First, they whistle. They send a chemical message. They whistle uh, to produce more of a protein called zonulin. And zonulin is the protein that opens up the space between the cells, which we call leaky gut. Zonulin opens up the space between the cells. So now, Water comes from the body into the gut to wash out the threat with the poop. So that's a life-saving mechanism. That's the first thing the toll-like receptors do. And the second thing they do is they activate the major amplifier of inflammation, which is called NF-kappa B. And it's the desk sergeant at the police station. Okay, you guys... You go over here and do this. You guys, I want you in that neighborhood over there doing this. You guys do this. NF-kappa B is the amplifier of all of the armed forces in your gut, right? So when the soldiers see a threat, a bug coming in, they activate immediately within five minutes. You've got leaky gut and you've got increased inflammation. Really, really quickly. It's a beautiful mechanism, you know, when you see how our body works, you go, wow, that is really cool Mm, that our bodies respond to kill a threat. So how does the soldier recognize that it's a threat? Because, you know, you just stayed a meal and you had a steak, you had mashed potatoes, there's gravy on the mashed potatoes, you had some vegetables, you got a little wine or a little Guinness, you know, whatever you're doing. Uh, there's this whole glob of food there. How does these soldiers, how do they recognize what's a threat and what's not? They look for what I call orange vests. Anything that's got an orange vest on it, they activate this response. So what's an orange vest? It's amino acids. They're pieces of proteins that they look at and that, that are part of the shell of the bug the outer shell of the bug is going to look like A, A, B, C, D. I'm making up the numbers, but that's the orange vest that the soldiers look for. And when they see that, there's no discussion. It's immediate activation of toll-like receptor. Toll-like receptor 4 activates zonulin and NF-kappa B. Immediate, it begins. The problem is that amino acid structure the orange vest of the bugs that are a threat. By the way, this is a life-saving mechanism. This is non-negotiable. And those ancestors that didn't have good protection, 
from bad bugs and the food they were eating, they died and they did not reproduce. Those ancestors that had really good toll-like receptor function, screening everything and getting activated to protect you when there was a bad bug that comes in, they survived and they reproduced. So the genetics of those early ancestors passed on to us today. We all have this going on in our gut. Every time you eat something, every single one of us has this going on, or you, you wouldn't be here. So, okay, so what, what happened here? When you eat wheat, the problem is no human can digest wheat down to the amino acids. Now, what does that mean? Think of protein like a pearl necklace. And the acid in your stomach undoes the clasp of the pearl necklace. Now you have a string of pearls. And it's your digestive enzymes in the mouth, in the gut, that act like scissors to cut that pearl necklace into smaller pieces. Snip, 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 until you're down to each pearl of the pearl necklace. We call those amino acids. And those amino acids go right through the gut wall into the bloodstream. That's how we absorb our proteins. And those amino acids are called the building blocks of life because they're the building blocks to make new bone cells and brain cells and all of that. That's how we get our nutrition from our food is that it's got to be digested, broken down into each pearl of the pearl necklace. Okay. The problem with wheat is that no human has the enzymes to break it down into each pearl of the pearl necklace. All you can do is break it into clumps of the pearl necklace. 33 amino acid clump, 18 amino acid clump, 11 amino acid clump, just clumps. And those clumps, the amino acid structure of those clumps look like the outer shell of a bug. So when you eat wheat, toll-like receptor, there to protect you, sees, look, over there, orange vest, A, A, B, C, D. And it activates the entire immune response to fight this bug in every person. Maureen Leonard, this is what they're teaching at Harvard. Maureen Leonard, a very famous gastroenterologist, published a paper where she looked at over 60 studies on this topic. And she wrote in her summary, gluten activates transient intestinal permeability, leaky gut, and inflammation in all humans who consume it. So anyone who's listening to this podcast, if you are a human, this relates to you. Now, your wife may not think you're human at times, but if you're human, every time you eat wheat, you activate toll-like receptor 4. Every single time. Well, I don't feel bad when I eat wheat. Wait a minute, wait a minute. We already dealt with that. The ratio is eight to one. For every one person that gets gut symptoms, there are eight that don't. You get brain dysfunction, joint dysfunction, skin dysfunction, liver dysfunction, heart dysfunction. You don't get gut dysfunction. So you can't determine if this is okay for you or not by how you feel. The only way to know is to do a comprehensive test that's extremely accurate. And look, I travel the world. I'm on stage. I was in um, Sao Paulo, Brazil in November, 1,200 doctors. I was in Rome in December, 300 doctors. I was in India in January, 700 doctors teaching this stuff. And I can tell you, the best test in the world is in the U.S. It's called the Wheat Zoomer because you zoom in on the problem. The tests that your doctors are doing are not accurate. Wait a minute, I shouldn't say like that. They're probably accurate. They're 70 to 80% accurate, but they're not comprehensive. They only look at one or two markers. But there are many, many markers of a sensitivity to wheat. There are 62 clumps of the pearl necklace that will activate an immune response. Why are you only checking one, doctor? Well, that's, well, that's what the lab offers us. So get a new lab 
And, you know, I talk to them that way because they don't think about this. Mm-hmm. And when they look at the new lab uh, and they look at the wheat zoomer and they see how accurate it is and they see the research papers from Mayo Clinic that tell how comprehensive this test is, they call it a new era in laboratory medicine. And Mayo Clinic doesn't give approval to different tests like that, but this is such a game changer. They, their language was, quote, a new era in laboratory medicine. Easy to do, convenient, inexpensive, uh, looks at 26 markers of inflammation in your body from wheat, um, and it's about 400 bucks. I mean, it's, it's reasonable mm-hmm. to find out, is my child's asthma due to a sensitivity to wheat? Is my daughter's seizures due to a sensitivity to wheat? Look, in the journal Gastroenterology, they published a paper that 50% of children with drug-resistant epilepsy. Well, what does that mean? It means they've tried at least three drugs and they don't work. The child's Mm -hmm. still getting seizures. 50% of children with drug-resistant epilepsy go into complete remission on a gluten-free diet. What? 50%. Well, why didn't my neurologist tell us that? Because it's written in a gastroenterology journal. Neuro- neurologists don't read gastroenterology journals. That's my job, is to get this information across the different disciplines. So they all go, what? What? What's the harm in trying a gluten-free diet in a child with seizures and nothing's working? Mm-hmm. What possible reason would you have for not checking this? Well. Um, There's no science behind. No, no, no. You've not read the science. Let's use proper language here. I mean, I put doctors on the spot when they give me that kind of crap, Mm. you know, because they're just CYA, excuse me, but covering your ass. Mm -hmm. Just read the science because it's people's lives we're dealing with here. And if you read the science, you don't believe it, then explore a little more. And if you find some fault in it, then, you know, of course, don't do it, but at least put the time in to look. And your jaw is going to drop time and again when you see how accurate these tests are. Thank you for going into that. Really important. And like in Ayurveda, functional medicine believes in like a system approach. So we're looking at the whole body, right, as a holistic system yes. rather than the reductionist Western approach. And really fascinating. Thank you for sharing that. Before we delve into inflammation, I want to just cover the the, uh, forever chemicals because that's something people need to be aware of. We've talked about the food. We've talked about the personal care products. But these PFAS forever chemicals are a real issue as well that people need to be aware of. Nonstick cookware, water repel and clothing, all that. Yes, yes. Well, why do I have to be aware of this? Well, what does the word forever mean? Well, it means it lasts a long time. No, no, no. Lasts a long time means it may not last at some point. What does forever mean? It means they're there forever. Yes. And what happens? Well, there's no evidence that the amount of forever chemicals that's in our food is toxic to humans. That's how they get away with this. Well, there's no evidence that the amount of forever chemicals that's in your shampoo is toxic to humans. And that's their... Common response again and again and again. That's what they stand behind. You can't talk to these people and the scientists that work for these companies. You can't talk to them because they're going to repeat the party line. Mm. Well, there's no evidence that the amount of toxic chemicals you're exposed to is toxic to humans. That's how they get away with it. They don't care. But ask them if their children are using toothpaste that has a warning on it says, do not swallow. If you do, Call poison control. How in the, I'm sorry, let me back (laughs) off a little bit. How is it possible for a parent, well, parents don't read labels, read the label on the toothpaste. And when you read the label on the toothpaste, do you think it's safe to put that in your child's mouth every day? Mm. Really? You know, excuse me, but it's like, wake up, people. Mm -hmm. We've got to wake up to the amount of poisons that are being put into our environment constantly for profit. It's yeah. poison for profit. Yeah, it's, it's astonishing. Astonishing and, and very you know, sad. You know, there's, 
there's there's really not much to say about the forever chemicals that the title doesn't tell you. It means that our immune systems have to fight this stuff because our detoxification pathways can't break it down and get rid of it. Mm. They're in you forever. Yeah. Unless you mobilize them and get them out. And they activate the triggers of disease. I'm going to jump in here because this is the perfect point for me to tell you about my next group discounted cleanse. If you're ready to eliminate this accumulation of toxins in the tissues, to balance the doshas, prevent inflammation and disease, then come join us. This cleanse comes with a 90-minute online consultation with me so that I can tailor the cleanse to your current health status and to your lifestyle. I tailor the recipes, the yoga, the self-care and the mindfulness practices. And then we come together in a private community where we can support each other and hold each other accountable. So if you're ready to cleanse in April, then join the waiting list and you can find the link in the show notes or visit my website, elementshealingandwellbeing.com. And for the April 19th group event, go to the events page. And if you wish to do a private cleanse and choose your own dates, check it out onto the programs page. So if you're ready to eliminate those accumulation of toxins and feel light, clear and energetic going into the new season, then come join us. And now let's get back to my conversation with Dr. O'Brien. We've talked about where these toxins are coming from. They're accumulating in our system, in our tissues, and this is triggering inflammation. Yes. So, Yeah, there, there is a drawing that came from David Thurman at Stanford. Um, he's also at the Buck Institute of Aging, a very famous researcher, um, uh, there is a drawing in a research paper that he did where uh, if you imagine three gears that are connected to each other, you know, I have a three-year-old son and we just bought a game for him where he can put gears on a pegboard. And if he puts them too close, the gears don't turn. And if he puts them too far away, they don't, you turn one, but it doesn't affect the other. So you have to put them at the right distance in the peg hole so that you can turn it. And then the other gear turns. And now he's got it down. He's got six or seven gears that are turning when he turns one gear, right? So imagine a drawing with three gears that are connected in a way like that. And the left gear, the one all the way over on the left, is the environment that we live in um, and the toxins that we're exposed to. Imagine that the foods that you eat, that's part of the environment. Imagine if uh, uh, the air that we're breathing is another one of the environments. Imagine, if you will, that uh, you're, you're carrying a spare tire around your midsections, and we know that the fat cells in obesity activate inflammation all by themselves. Imagine that you've got a little mold in your house. Well, it's not too bad. You know, it doesn't bother me. It's not too bad. But you're breathing it constantly or bacteria that you're exposed to or viruses you're exposed to or the foods that you're choosing to eat or you have so much stress. You're in a toxic relationship and the stress hormones are constant causing and uh, turning that wheel on the left side. And you're not getting enough sleep, which will turn that wheel, that gear on the left slide. And you've got accumulated toxins in your body, lead, mercury, forever chemicals, petroleum byproducts, volatile organic compounds. Uh, they're turning that wheel on the left side. So that wheel on the left side is turning. It turns the wheel in the middle of these three wheels that are connected. And the wheel in the middle is your immune system producing inflammation to fight this bacteria and viruses or mold you've been exposed to, to fight these fat cells uh, that, are, that are creating so much metabolic chaos in your body, to fight the bad foods you're eating like French fries or deep fried foods or processed foods, to fight the amount of sugar you're eating, to fight the stress hormones. Um, not getting the, enough sleep or these chemicals that you're exposed to, your immune system is fighting, fighting, fighting. And that's the wheel in the center that gets activated is this chronic inflammation to deal with 
the infections, the food choices, uh, too many bad guys in the gut, not enough good guys, the chronic stress hormones, all of that, that it's your immune system that's activated, turning the wheel in the middle of these three gears, and then that turns the gear on the right that you, that is how your disease manifests. Is it type 2 diabetes? Is it cardiovascular disease? Is it cancer? Is it depression or anxiety? Is it autoimmune diseases? Is it neurodegenerative diseases? Is it loss of your memory? Is it osteoporosis? What is it? So this drawing shows us that it's lifestyle on the left side of the wheel that activates the immune system, the middle wheel, producing inflammation to fight these triggers that activates the wheel on the right side. And then depending on your genetic vulnerability and how you live your life, that's the weak link in your chain where the disease is going to show. That drawing by David Furman, it's such a great drawing because you see that chronic emotional stress is just as big a contributor as a bacterial infection to creating inflammation. And in our event, the inflammation equation, when you hear Dr. Jeffrey Bland, the founder of functional medicine, say, you know, Tom, that a negative thought has just as much power to fuel an inflammatory response. Those stress hormones have just as much power as the exposure to SARS-CoV-2 virus. Mm. And he quotes two studies on that. And it's like, what? What? So that, so Dr. Bland, does that mean that everything on the left side of this drawing of these three gears, that we really want to put a little bit of attention on every one of these gears? He said, absolutely. It is the only way to reduce the amount of inflammation that is fueling the development. Look, The Center for Disease Control tells us that 14 of the top 15 causes of death in the world today are chronic inflammatory diseases. It's always inflammation. Oh, without exception. 14 and 15. The 15th, unintentional injuries, accidents. Everything else is a chronic inflammatory disease. It doesn't matter what it is. So what that means is that you always have to look at where is the inflammation coming from. It doesn't matter what your symptoms are. Mm -hmm. You always have to include where is the inflammation coming from. You know, I was privileged to write the chapter in two cardiovascular medicine textbooks that are used in medical schools to um, educate students. And I, in one of the chapters, I wrote that the uh, historical misconception that cardiovascular disease is a lipid storage disease, meaning fats, cholesterol, uh, was disproven in 1986. We have known since then that it is an inflammatory disease. It's always inflammation that causes your pipes to plug up. Always, without exception. So what does that mean? So the cardiologist is now stuck in two separate lines of thinking. How do I address the presenting complaint, perhaps life-threatening, like uh, a heart attack or uh, high blood pressure or weakened heart muscle? Uh, um, How do I, what do I do for this patient to reduce those symptoms so they can function a little bit better? And the second line of thinking they have to do is Where is the inflammation coming from that's causing all of this? Now, unfortunately, in our medical education today, our specialists are not trained in that second line of thinking. They're trained exclusively on that first line of thinking, and they're really good at what they do. And Mm. you have high blood pressure, you better take the medication. But the high blood pressure is not a deficiency of medication that you're going to fix by taking the medication. Yes, you put a lid on the pressure cooker for a while, but you have to find out where is the inflammation coming from that's causing the high blood pressure. 
Where is the inflammation coming from that's causing my memory gaps? Where is the inflammation coming from that's causing my thyroid dysfunction? Where is the inflammation coming from that's causing my psoriasis? Where is the inflammation coming from that's causing my child's attention deficit? You have to ask that question if you want higher levels of health. Indeed, and it is really looking at the root cause, you say, but doing a holistic assessment in regards your exposure to toxins, your stress levels, and your lifestyle, right? What you're doing day in, day out, it all has a a accumulation factor. We talk about the accumulation with toxins, what we're doing day in, day out also affects our health and taking stock and being aware of what those daily habits are, what we're stress we're exposed to and the toxins we're exposed to. That is exactly why I have spent a year and traveled to seven countries interviewing the world leaders in gut health, brain health, immune function health, the world leaders, and ask them these specific questions about inflammation and where it comes from and what's the goal with every chronic disease. And they all say the same thing in their own way. It was really interesting to see that. I'm thinking of putting a thing together at the end that might be four or five minutes, you know, the 60 plus world leaders going, reduce the inflammation, reduce the, well, it's the inflammation. It's always inflammation, reduce the inflammation. They all say that, you know, and I think I might do that. I'd never thought of that until just now, but I think I'm going to do that as a gift for people. So put together the best minds in the world. And what are they telling you about how to be healthier? And this is it reduce your inflammation. Mm. And this topic of environmental chemicals and toxins is a critically important one. You know, I've asked my friends who are very famous uh, clinicians, one has a two and a half year waiting list for new patients, and the other has a five year waiting list. You want to see Dr. Jill Carnahan, you get on the list. It's five years. And they'll call you and say, hi, Dr. Carnahan, we'll have an opening in three months four and a half years after you got on the list, right? So, you know, they're my friends. And I've asked them, I've asked them, how often do you get a negative back on a first total tox burden test? And we were at dinner and I asked Jill and she almost spit out the wine that the glass was in her mouth. Jill, like this, <laughs> never, everybody is so accumulated with these total talk. Well, I feel fine. Well, we'll put that on your tombstone. They felt fine until they didn't, you know, that we all are being exposed to these incredible levels of toxins every day. And until you're aware of it, you don't do anything about it. It's kind of, it's kind of a cerebral exercise until somebody scares the pants off of you. And you say, wow, I really need to look at this. Your son's attention deficit is strongly fueled by the amount of environmental toxins that have accumulated in his body. Look mm-hmm. at his mercury level. Look at his lead level. Look at these petrochemicals that have accumulated. Look at the mold metabolites in his body. Then just Google mold and attention deficit. And parents, their jaws drop. They never would have imagined that this was possible. That's why I've, I've put together the inflammation equation. Because it is the go-to event in the world, no one's ever done this before, that gets this message across that becomes the baseline question for every health concern you have. It doesn't matter what it is, but you will be trained in asking the question, how did I feel the inflammation for this? Well, you know what? I started eating French fries again. Oh, that, that probably did it. Yeah, because I was great for salt. You know, you'll start processing and you'll start thinking for yourself once we train you how to ask the questions and to investigate. NASA, David Furman did this because he has a contract with NASA to figure out why the astronauts are aging in space. NASA financed the studies on house plants and they show us that two Six-inch houseplants in a 10-by-10 room absorbs over 74% of the toxins in the air. Well, I don't have any toxins in my bedroom. Oh, really? 
then you just don't know that your sheets, your blankets, and your quilts, if they're not organic cotton, they're soaked in flame retardant chemicals. And they're outgassing for years into the air. Your mattress is flame retardant chemicals outgassing into the air. The carpeting has flame retardant chemicals. The chair, the the lounge chair in your bedroom has um, uh, scotch guard to prevent uh, stains on it. Uh, the the nightstand next to your bed, if it's not solid wood, it's press board soaked in formaldehyde. And it's outgassing into the air for years. Well, I don't smell anything. Well, you're not going to smell it. It's minute levels, but they accumulate in your body. Well, my air is clean in the bedroom. Really? Have you ever looked from the right angle and you see the sunlight, a rays of sun coming in through the window and you see the dust in the air? That's what you're breathing. And it's full of all these toxic chemicals until you learn how to detox your home. Yeah, and even looking at things like candles, the scented candles, the air right. fresheners, the plug-ins, all that. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Our body's overloaded. It's amazing that you're providing this summit. So can you tell us a little bit about more about the this the summit? Um it's going to be available on live stream March 20th. Yes. And as you said, you've put a lot of work into this. You've traveled and interviewed a lot of people. Uh, so oh, if you tell us a little amazing. bit more. Yeah, it's just amazing. Yeah, the the website is theinflammationequation.com forward slash Kent. And when you go there to register, you see the list of all of the people. Wow, Yehuda Schoenfeld from Tel Aviv. This guy, uh, many medical doctors that want their PhD in immunology go to his department at Tel Aviv University. It's the best in the world. And 26 of the MD PhDs who received their degree from him 26, there are many, many more, but 26 now chair departments of immunology in medical schools and hospitals around the world. They're his students. This is the godfather. And he and I shared the stage together uh, in the first weekend of December in Rome. And he made this comment that we all were just, what? We are born. 99% human. What that means is that there's a little bit of bacteria in our guts at birth that we got from mom. It's not sterile. There's a little bit of bacteria, but then baby gets bacteria really quickly, hopefully coming down the, nat- the birth canal in natural childbirth, or if born by C-section, baby gets uh, bacteria in the environment of the emergency room, which is not good. Uh, but we were born 99% human. All the cells in the, almost all the cells in the body are human cells. Now, many of us have heard that uh, there's uh, 10 times more cells of bacteria in our gut or in our bodies than human cells. Many of us have heard that. We, we don't know what to do with that statement. It's kind of a cerebral exercise. Uh, but Schoenfeld put it in perspective. We're born 99% human and we die 90% microbial. We're 90% bacteria. Well, we know that's true. Well, I'm still a human. No, you're actually a whole bunch of bacteria having a human experience. So we're born 99% human and we die 90% microbial. What does that mean? Well, professor, so then I asked him, I interviewed him. I said, professor, so you made the statement, we're born 99% human and we die 90% microbial. Yes. Well, wouldn't that mean that we really are uh, uh, a consortium of microbes having a human experience? Yes. So you told us that 36% of all the small molecules in the healthy blood are the exhaust of the bacteria in the gut. Kind of like lactic acids, the exhaust of your muscles, that the exhaust is called short-chain fatty acids. And 36% of the exhaust of the bacteria in your gut are the metabolites that get into the bloodstream. Yes. And that those metabolites that get into the bloodstream are the messengers 
that are carrying direction to the brain on how many neurotransmitters to make, nerve hormones. Yes. And they carry messages to the heart on how hard the heart should be pumping. Yes. And they carry messages to the liver on what detox pathways need to be keyed up right now. Yes. So these messengers in the gut, they have this exhaust that gets into the bloodstream. It makes up 36% of all the small molecules in the bloodstream. And they're going everywhere. Your bloodstream's just a highway carrying traffic. Lots, all, all go in the same direction. And the, the highway is carrying the, these messengers from the gut that are instructing our entire body on how to function. Yes. Well, then wouldn't it be accurate to say it's critically important, perhaps the most important thing you can do to have a healthier future is to build a healthy, diverse microbiome. That is the emphasis of our entire immunology department at Tel Aviv University. So these people spend years and years and years of study and hundreds of thousands of dollars in education to tell you the best thing you can do that has the most bang for your buck is build a healthy, diverse microbiome. Nothing gives you more bang for the buck than that. And that's what we're teaching you, is how to interpret what these world-class experts are telling us in a way that makes it implementable for you and your family. So that's our goal. We invite you all to come to theinflammationequation.com forward slash Kent. I love it. Ayurveda has the same goal. It's all about the gut health and building the microbiome. We're all wanting the same thing. The body always wants to be healthier. You have an entire new body every few years. You have an entire new immune system every couple of months. You have an autoimmune disease. How freeing is it to know that you have an entirely new immune system every two months? Well, what does that mean? It means that you can eventually calm down the current immune system that's causing your autoimmune disease and have it just chill out and relax. Well, I really look forward to watching this summit and I encourage others to watch it. You put in a lot of work into this. I will put the link in the show notes as well. And Dr. O'Brien, I truly appreciate you taking the time to chat with us today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Dr. Tom O'Brien and please check out the link in the show notes for the inflammationequation.com forward slash Kent and you can get the link to watch the live stream on March 20th, a really valuable source of information. So please check that out. If you think that this episode will be helpful to family or friends, please share it with them so we can spread this important information. And also check out the link in the show notes to my next discounted group cleanse starting April 19th or visit my website elementshealingandwellbeing.com. If you haven't already subscribed or followed the podcast, please do so and the new episodes will automatically download for you. And if you find this podcast beneficial, then please leave a rating and review wherever you listen to your podcast so it can help other people to find it. You can find me on social media under Elements Healing and Wellbeing on Facebook and my new Instagram page, Elements of Ayurveda Podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. And until next time, take good care of yourself. Be well and bye for now. Slongafol.